Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Dr. Satyajit Rath and we'll discuss even if the vaccines do become available and we'll discuss when it's likely to be available, how will it reach the people, whether it will ever at all reach the people who really need it. Satyajit, it does look like now by end of the year, among all the vaccines which are on phase three trials now, uh, some of them will act, be available or at least get into manufacture. Now, is that likely as a scenario? Do you think by beginning of next year, we'll see the availability of the vaccines at least to some people? So uh, let's start with a, uh, what shall we say, statutory disclaimer. The statutory disclaimer is that while all preliminary evidence for all the half a dozen plus vaccines that are now in phase three clinical trials, for all of them, the preliminary evidence looks good. But that is no guarantee or even assurance that they will provide reliable, reasonable term protection. That's a statutory disclaimer. Because this is a matter of trial and error. The proof of the pudding will be in the eating and the phase three clinical trial will show this. That said, the answer to your question is still with a spoonful of optimism, most likely yes. We will see more than one vaccine with a reasonable degree of protection my guess is, by the end of the year. And if we take WHO statement that the vaccine is not the silver bullet, of course, silver bullet refers to, as you know, vampires, and therefore there is a bat uh, somewhere in the picture in the silver bullet uh, imagery. But having taken that for granted, uh, shall we say that also that we do not know for how long the immunity would last. That is the other question mark that hangs over all of this. Right. So WHO's cautious optimism, which leads it to say uh, that the vaccine is unlikely to be a silver bullet, refers to the way I phrased uh, our uh, statement just now, to say reasonable degree of protection for a reasonable length of time. And uh, two disclaimers. People may not have understood this. You're making two disclaimers here. Reasonable yes. degree of protection, not 100% protection, maybe 70%, 80%. And other is we don't know for how long, a reasonable how. time. These are the two disclaimers you've put. Yes. Okay. So, and, and those are the uncertainties that the WHO silver bullet comment is referring to. Although I must confess that the first thing that struck me as well was that this was in the context of the um, bat species of the world, this was a particularly unfortunate uh, usage of imagery. But yes, that's what is intended. Okay. So having got that out of the way, the question is, of course, that we have now a number of these vaccines entering trials. There are also two Russian vaccines which seem to be entering trials. There are two Chinese vaccines. There is two US ones. Uh, one Moderna, I think one Pfizer is also there. And then, of course, we have the AstraZeneca, which is a tie-up with India with the Serum Institute. The Serum Institute is also uh, now proposing trials to be held in India with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, all of this, the question, and I will start with the selfish argument uh, in terms of India. Is it likely to be available to India in the beginning of the year? Is that a likelihood? Let us take the most optimistic scenario for India and describe that. The most optimistic scenario for India would be the chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine trial, which is in phase three trial in more than one location across the world now, to show results that are sufficiently striking for their um, uh, DMSB, their data, data management and security board, 
to say, oh, stop the trial, we're done. At that point, supposing, for example, that happens by October or November, by that point, if um, the Serum Institute of India has actually managed to put together a reasonable stockpile of that vaccine, then what we might have is an actual vaccine rather than a vaccine candidate that is available in India and for which, politically speaking, politically in the broadest sense, politically speaking, a public commitment has been made that half the stock will be immediately available for usage in India. And if that happens, now that's a whole series of optimistic assumptions. If that happens, then I would imagine that by the end of the year, we will begin to have particularly at risk groups beginning to be vaccinated. Okay. Now you have raised, I'm going to reduce all those disclaimers, which you're so fond of putting so that we get some figures, uh, which, uh, you know, we can talk about, which is that assuming that we have by October, we have the some proof, November, acceptance, December production. So beginning of January, this is your optimistic scenario. Beginning of Jan January, we start seeing vaccines being manufactured. Now the question, 50% of that being made available to India, that's the real question. And again, secondly, that AstraZeneca has contracted with Serum Institute. Now, while 50% may be available, but it doesn't mean the first batch will be split 50-50. It could be, yes, it will be available, but the first dibs is for the UK who want 60 million to be given to UK first. And then uh, the UK, United States, which has, I think, given about 1.2 or $1.5 billion to uh, AstraZeneca again. And then they get the second lot, which could be 300 million. And after that, you will get half. That means 360 million could be after this three first 360 million are delivered. It's possible, isn't it? So, um, absolutely. And, and a core issue in all of this is that we, in the sense of public discourse, only know what the protagonists in these commercial agreements are willing to tell us. We haven't seen the agreements. We haven't seen the, con the consultative commitments that they've made to each other. So when the Serum Institute of India, with uh, all good intentions and goodwill in the world, says that they have a billion dose capacity, what the timeline for supplying this billion dose itself is quite unclear. Sim similarly, as you point out, out what the priority of the 50-50 commitment to India versus overseas will be for each batch of vaccine as it comes out of production is entirely unclear. So it's quite possible, as you point out, that the first few batches may simply go overseas to meet AstraZeneca's um, The core problem in all of this is that we have no idea of the detail and the devil is in the detail. And therefore, this is something to worry about quite seriously. So in these agreements, as you put it, the devil is really in the detail. And it, 50 is okay, but 50 when, 50 or what are all unknown unknowns in this particular case. So we really don't know. And uh, the point simply is that there are commitments which are commercial commitments that AstraZeneca has made being in supported by UK. They have taken money and Oxford's facilities for this. And therefore there is a stake that UK has in the vaccine. And they have taken a lot of money from the United States as well. So having done that, there is a commitment, obviously, this is nothing is for charity. So there is a commitment of quid pro quo. And that is of course, delivery of the actual produced vaccine. And if Serum Institute is as the largest uh, gen uh, generic vaccine producer in the world as a tie-up with AstraZeneca, they have to probably 
look at the fine print of AstraZeneca's contract and of course what is their contract with them, both of which are unknowns at the moment. So it is not clear that just because the vaccine is there, it is successful and it is being manufactured in India that we shall therefore start seeing the vaccines delivered to our markets immediately. And of course we have 1.3 billion people and that's hell of a lot of vaccine doses we are talking about. So question to you Satyajit, and you have been also as much into the intellectual property uh, discussions as anybody else in the science movement and the health movement to both of, to which you, go, you belong to both of these. The question is, is that under the Patent Act, don't you have provisions to get around this? Because the Section 92 says we can actually break any patent for a health emergency or an epidemic. And every, everybody recognizes we have both of these on our hands at the moment. WHO has called it a pandemic. Government of India has called it under Disaster Management Act, disaster. So both ways it is satisfied. The question is, do we, having the legal instrument, do we have the scientific and technical infrastructure to actually execute this and break, if necessary, AstraZeneca's patent or whatever the property rights may be and manufacture it using public sector instruments that are there? So, um, sadly, the answer is going to be that in principle, all of this is possible. In practice, in all likelihood, it is not going to happen. So, let me unpack that. In the first place, all of these vaccine candidates that we are talking about at the moment are um, vaccine candidates that depend on a very specifically configured and designed vaccine delivery system. So copying that, manufacturing that are um, in manufacturing terms, cutting edge technologies. In terms of laboratory science, they're not cutting edge technologies. But in manufacturing terms, they're cutting edge technologies. So the real question becomes, who has the capacity to do this? And who will actually do it? So does Indian public sector science and technology uh, have the capacity to rebuild these sequences, for example, of the Oxford vaccine vector or the Moderna RNA? Absolutely, yes. But the trouble is that they only have the capacity to do it at the lab scale. So which biopharmaceutical manufacturers have the capacity to do this at the manufacturing scale? And the answer to that is that there's only a small handful of private sector manufacturers who can do this. Will they do this? The chances are no, because they will face downstream ostracism of all sorts from these original IPR holder companies with whom all said and done they have to be um, in business for a long time to come. So do I expect that the private sector will take up the challenge even if the government actually breaks uh, formally by legal notification um, the patent rights? And my guess is that the private sector manufacturers who will be willing will not have the manufacturing technological ability and those who have the ability will not be willing. So what remains is the public sector. So the real question to ask is, does the public sector have this capacity? And the answer to that is, we don't know. We have no idea what the current capacities of both moribund and non-moribund public sector manufacturing enterprises are in the country. It's astonishing to me that over these past few months, when it has become more and more apparent that public sector manufacturing is likely to be a major factor in a policy response to COVID-19 as a pandemic, the government has made absolutely not one peep about the state of public sector manufacturing. 
It's, you know, it's, uh, what you're saying is absolutely uh, spot on, that this government, as well as the earlier governments, have believed that the public sector is no longer critical to India's economy or India's technological development, which earlier was not the issue. And also that the public sector, public health are intrinsically linked in this particular ways is also not something that they seem to have recognized till we got the pandemic. Now, you were in Hafiken Institute uh, earlier, once upon a time in your student days. And uh, I think after your postdoc also, postdoc also sometime. So Hafkin Institute had started essentially for playing vaccines. This is what it really was set up to do in the 20s and did it in the 30s. At the time, we did not even have the antibiotics and the sulfurs, sulfur drugs, which uh, stopped playing later. So this is where the vaccine Hafkin Institute was mass producing vaccine in the 30s, if my memory serves me correct. And they seem to have given it up when other public sector units came up. And they said, we'll do the research, but not the uh, vaccine production itself. But at that time, we had built in the public sector also the vaccine uh, production capability. So what happened to all of that? So um, a small digression since you brought up my um, 40, 35, 40 year old years back connection to the Hopkins Institute. A small digression about the Hopkins Institute as a public sector manufacturing capacity. So in the first place, while we all refer to it as the Afghan Institute capacity, um, since about 1977, uh, the Hafkin Institute formally has not been the manufacturing uh, public sector organization at all. The Hafkin Institute is simply a state level science and technology institute, research institute. So because in 77, the entire composite enterprise but was bifurcated and the public sector manufacturing unit was spun off separately as Hafkin, presciently as Hafkin Biopharmaceutical Corporation. Not pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical Bio corporation. And in the early years of the Hafkin Biopharmaceutical Corporation, it continued to build its already well-established strength in vaccine manufacture by actual on-site manufacture of polio vaccine, for example. But as we come into the 90s, if we look back, in common with the disdain and the um, ignoring of public sector manufacturing, particularly in the drugs and vaccine sector, the Hafkin Biopharmaceutical Corporation was similarly starved of technological upgrades, both in their human resources and in their manufacturing uh, resources. So that in common with many other public sector vaccine manufacturers, the Hafkin Biopharmaceutical Corporation has also regressed from being capable of um, vaccine manufactured from scratch to being essentially a repackager by buying bulk from outside and repackaging doses. Now, I'm, I speak as an outsider today. Uh, my 35-year-old uh, association doesn't give me any special information, but it's part of uh, public knowledge that this is what we've done to the Central Vaccine Institute in Kasoli, the King's Institute, Hafkin Biopharmaceutical Corporation, and in the broader pharma sector to the Indian Drugs and Pharmaceuticals Limited, and of course, to Hindustan Antibiotics. So across the board, we have systematically starved our public sector biopharma manufacturing capacity of human as well as technological upgrades that would keep them competitive for manufacture from scratch. And as a result, today, I'm not sure that they have the capacity. Now, let me bring up one interesting public sector manufacturing possibility. The government of India, if, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years ago, something like that, built 
a company public sector company called bibco um bharat immunologicals and biologicals or something like that bibco um it's look it's its works are located near delhi i think in or near bulandshahar this is a public sector company under the ministry of science and technology okay it's recently set up i am astonished do they have the capacity can they build capacity can they be part of our strategic tactical approach to providing drugs biologicals and vaccines for india during the covid-19 pandemic none of us seems to have asked this most astonishingly we have an opposition that doesn't seem to have asked this at all so these are the kind of questions at least the people science movements need to ask in the country or the people's health movements need to ask in the country so i'm, I'm glad that we are having this discussion but you know one clarification just for our viewers that when you talk about the biopharmaceuticals you really talking about both vaccines which are the, one of the oldest modern medicine uh, repertoire that we have as well as the biologicals which are the latest in the uh, what what we will call as the weapons we have against the germ microbes so vaccines the oldest and in this sense the biologicals the latest both come under the biopharmaceutical as distinct from the chemical pharmaceutical sector this is a, a distinction which may not be known to most of the viewers absolutely yes as a matter of fact let me give the more um, sort of shallow entertaining uh, um, add on to that the first nobel prize in physiology and medicine ever went for something called serum therapy to emil von behring which is the equivalent of the plasma therapy that everybody is talking about so clearly a biologic and or vaccine related product and one of the more recent nobel prizes in cancer immunotherapy has also been about biologics that modulate immune responses so absolutely you 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 put it very well and and um, that is indeed the biopharma sector ambit so if we conclude with this that we have the scientific and technical capability the question is do we have the political will as the government of india and as the people of india I'm not going to put it only on the government of india to also now say if not now then when that if we do not pull our socks as they put it uh, bluntly uh, rather weak uh, uh, phrase i'm afraid but if we don't do it right now and do this on a scale which it requires to be done we are talking about not millions you are talking of really 1.3 billion and if who's uh, caution is to be taken for granted or yours for that matters that we don't know the duration we may require it every year or every two years so this right. is really a mammoth task just for india alone not doing what we did during the aids epidemic where we came virtually the pharmacy of the world because all said and done 7.5 billion people were not at risk unlike the covid-19 case so therefore this was really a much smaller task than what we face today but it is interesting that the government of india is yeah i think you've said this earlier willing to bank upon the goodwill and the uh, dynamism if that is what we should be talking about of indian capital and its philanthropy to provide the people with the medicines and the vaccine it requires it doesn't seem to have anything else except given permission and talking the good talk that's where it seems to be but beyond the talk we don't see much that seems to be happening at least visible so let me quote our um, 1000 year old master of the pithy statement in what question we should be asking the government abahu nahi to kabahu milega nahi to jampur basa this is what kabir said अब नहीं मिलेगा तो कब मिलेगा 
अगर ना मिले तो यम की नगरी में जाना है सो दैट इज द क्वेश्चन दैट एज अप टू डेट ए थाउजेंड ईयर ओल्ड क्वेश्चन इज दैट either the vaccine or the possibility of a yamapuri though the only thing is this is not a mortal disease as you have said earlier let's not scare the people too much getting covid 19 is not a individual risk as a social risk because even if the percentage of figures are say 1 or 2% that may appear for us a small risk for society it's a huge number and that's where the yamapuri threat comes out so the yamapuri threat comes up to simply take your point further not because as you say covid 19 is an individually high risk disease but because if we don't keep spread under control the disaster visited upon our socio economic life is going to start killing people who do not have covid 19 that's that and for the government not to have a policy to address these effectively horrifying possibilities is irresponsible at best thank you very much satyajit for being with us taking us through rather difficult techno technological terrain and it's not a simple issue when you talk about vaccines biopharmaceuticals and of course the larger social political economic issues this is all the time we have for this click today do keep watching news click do visit our website and also our youtube channel